And then Hannah, Kylie, and Stephanie, you guys can take over. So how do we take over presenter? Are we like, I don't know what that is. That's a good question. I know Rachel just automatically kind of did it. I was like, okay. what? Oh, you're already there. Let's see. Are you cool if we just tell you like to move to the next slide when oh. we're ready? Yeah, you can do that too. Yep. Yeah, let's do that. Sounds good. Go for that. Is Hannah on? Yeah, I'm right here. Um, I can start us off. Um, so our presentation is on to turmeric. I always say turmeric. So if you hear it called that, it's probably uh, turmeric. Um, we can go to the next slide. So kind of a general history of this. Um, it is a plant. Uh, turmeric is basically the root of the plant and it's in the ginger family. Um, it's native to Southeast Asia, like China, India. Uh, the rhizome is what the kind of root or stem section is. And they kind of grind it up. They can do it chunky or they can put it into like a powder form. Um, and it's really often used in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, in India, it's used for skin, upper respiratory tract, joint, digestive. Um, and then it's used here for lots of different reasons. They can use it into spices uh, for like cooking, um, especially in more Indian dishes. And then it's also used as dietary supplements for um, like arthritis, degenerative disorders, respiratory infections, allergies, liver disease, depression. Um, and like I said, a whole bunch of other things. And then you can go to the next slide. All right, I can read this one. Um, so we just wanted to include some little tidbits about turmeric. So it's super, it's a very, very extremely potent anti-inflammatory. And how it works is it blocks the cytokines and the enzymes, especially, um, I'll probably butcher this, you guys, but the five blocks or LOX and then the COX-2, um, the drug celecoxib aims, the, so the one that we just learned about also aims to block these. Um, so there are lots of claims made that state that turmeric decreases, decreases inflammation and reduces pain and stiffness that are caused by rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. It also treats bursitis. Um, interestingly enough, pure whole turmeric more often than not contains lead, so you should use a curcumin extract if you choose to take it in a capsule form. And it will say it on the bottle, it will say turmeric and curcumin. And then another important thing to note is that high doses of turmeric are dangerous and they can act as blood thinners in really high amounts. Um, so you need to be very careful with that. And then they can also cause an upset stomach. So be careful when you take it. I can read this one. Um, so dose strength and standardization. So the extract is standardized to, I was just saying, um, it's also used for dyspepsia, and so you would just take 500 milligram by mouth, um, and then efficacy. So it's effective in dyspepsia, and then there's not a lot of evidence for other uses. Um, previous studies have used it with Alzheimer's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammation, and cancers. So um, if you're using it for arthritis, you would take 500 milligrams. Um, by mouth twice a day, um, it is rec that's the recommended dose. Um, so check for improve with absorption. Like please. Okay. Um, so for formulations, I kind of talked about this earlier, um, but you can use it orally. Um, and orally, like if it's in a regulated or efficacy dose, um, that's again gonna be used for hemorrhage, diarrhea, bloating, loss of appetite, uh, respiratory infections, fever. Um, and that would be more like a capsule um, that you're gonna swallow. The topical would be into like different creams. They can use it for um, like analgesia, worms, ringworm, uh, bruising, leech bites, infections. Um, and again, just rubbing it onto the skin and then powder formations. Um, 
would be more of like the spice that you can buy um, at the grocery store, uh, would be in different types of dishes, smoothies, salads, things like that. Next slide. All right. Um, so specialty supplement versus the herbal product. So there are specialty supplements that are monitored by the FDA, whereas herbal products are typically not ever. Um, sometimes herbal products are going to be used in some specialty supplements. In general, turmeric is an herbal product, but it is also used in some supplements. So it's just good to keep that in mind. Okay, so using turmeric versus conventional med medical therapy. Um, so in 2016, they reviewed six different studies that were regarding the efficacy of turmeric as an anti-inflammatory. Um, a lot of people, a lot, a good way. To... The longest study only lasted four months. And then this is just a quote from um, some of those it says in 2016, an industry sponsored systematic review of randomized controlled trials found that 1000 milligrams a day of curcumin reduced osteoarthritis pain and inflammation as well as non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like um, I am I cannot say that word <laughs> and ibuprofen. Um, another 2016 study suggests that curcumin might help prevent bone breakdown in people with You cut out, but I think she's done with the slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and just so you know, it's diclofenac. Um, so interactions and adverse reactions, you definitely want to be careful when you're taking this, um, not mixing it with other anti-inflammatories. Um, obviously, we just learned about all those, so you should be pretty familiar with which ones not to take it with. Uh, you'll also want to avoid it prior to surgery because it can cause um, increased bleeding just like other NSAIDs. Um, or anti-inflammatories. Um, you also want to avoid it if you have a bile duct obstruction or gastric ulcers, it can cause further GI irritation. Um, and avoid in pregnancy just simply because studies haven't been done on it. So we really don't know the safety of using um, that herbal supplement while you're pregnant. And then avoid if you have any gallbladder disease. All right, then we just wanted to, to quickly discuss herb-herb interactions as well as adverse effects and side effects. Um, so something that we found throughout the studies, well, throughout studying about turmeric was that you need to watch when you choose to have cinnamon and turmeric together just because both of those increase anticoagulation. So it's just important to be careful. Um, so the adverse effects of turmeric are GI disturbances with chronic use. They act as natural blood thinners with chronic use. So it's not like you're going to take it once and then bam, all of a sudden you have really thin blood. That's not how it works. <laughs> you have to take it for a long time. Um, one person did report having abnormal heart rhythms after taking over 1500 milligrams orally BID or twice a day. Um, most people don't usually take that much turmeric. However, it can happen. So just be careful. And then again, high doses can lower blood pressure and blood sugar. And then common side effects are an upset stomach risk of developing kidney stones, it can cause diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Um, it may cause an allergic reaction and you may have, it may give you a side effect of iron deficiency. Just okay. really quick before you go, Kylie. So yeah. again, on that last slide, there aren't a lot of studies for like long-term use of turmeric either, because as far as like bringing it to the US and how we're using it, there's no studies like if that's going to affect any of your body systems or organs long term. So just keep that in mind as well. Okay. And so as we've discussed, the active ingredient is curcumin, um, at least with the anti-inflammatory properties. It's a great antioxidant and it was recently found to have anti-cancer effects according to the National Library of Medicine. Um, it is a rhizome or a root. Um, so that is from the ginger family. Um, however, curcumin root is unstable. Next slide, please. Oh, okay. Sorry, Hannah. Give me one second. So before we go over this, um, we just want you guys to like either type in the chat box or write down like some ways that you guys could think of um, 
implementing turmeric into your daily regime in order to reduce inflammation um, or ways that you think that it would help you. And that's our activity. And we can move on to the next slide. <laughs> So while you guys are thinking of that, um, my mom's friend really likes to experiment with different foods. And so she came up with this recipe and it's super nice because you can just stick it in like a Ziploc baggie. Um, and when we lived in Europe, we traveled a lot. And so we just like have this and you just like eat it really fast on the train or wherever you're going. Um, so this is something that I like to eat at work because it's pretty easy to put together. Um, I also have arthritis in my left hip. And it kind of sucks sometimes. <laughs> I've done a lot of different things to help it. Um, like food makes a really big difference. Um, like no dairy, no sugar. Gluten doesn't seem to bother me. Um, but anyway, so I just wanted to share this recipe so you guys just like have an idea of different kinds of stuff that you can stick it in. And I also included it on the reference page of our handout. So if you guys are curious, you can go ahead and try it if you want. And then as we were like talking about turmeric and different things, um, Kylie actually mentioned that she noticed it whitened her teeth, which is kind of crazy. I'm not exactly sure if she just like brushed it on her teeth or. Yeah. So um, if you, so it's using the oil pulling method, you basically just mix like a quarter teaspoon of turmeric powder or like the seasoning. So cool. And it looks like Victoria uses it on her dark spots as well. There's turmeric tea, almond milk, green tea, smoothies, curry, mac and cheese, if you're Kylie. <laughs> so lots of different ways to use it. Super cool. That's awesome. Okay. Are you guys, I assume you guys are done. <laughs> yeah, we are. Thank you. Good job, guys. Okay, let me um, load up my slides for the next. Hey, Corby. While you're loading that, I do have a question. So on the drug cards, when we're doing these cams, are we just adding, like, general information about like the herb or are we trying to associate like pharmacology, therapeutic use, antidotes? Um, all of the above. <laughs> so basically any information. I mean, obviously you have some kind of like pharmacological use for it because that's why we're, you know, that's what we're learning about. Um, but yeah, just general, just general information, just things that, like, say if your patient came in saying, hey, I'm, I'm using turmeric, just um, um, just general things that you maybe would want to know about it. Okay. All right. So let me just preface this by saying it is moving day. And they are freaking loud outside my door. <laughs> so if you hear banging and yelling and all sorts of stuff, that is probably them. Um, and my camera still just is not working. I'll try this again. Okay. Well, that's thinking. I'll just continue. So this week, we are going to cover chapter 15 and 16, and it's our adrenergic and cholinergic um, systems or um, drugs. So a lot, when I started last semester, I was told by almost every single instructor that this was the hardest test. Um, I don't think every student will agree with you or will agree with that. Um, but I would, oh, there we go. I think it's working now. But I would um, probably count on this next test being one of the hardest. Partly because 
we're dealing with the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And if you can't, if you have a hard time keeping them straight, you might get them mixed up. And if you do that, you'll get a lot of questions wrong. Okay, so you gotta, we gotta try to keep it um, situated and like know <laughs> the parasympathetic and what it does and the, then the sympathetic and what it does and what the antagonists do. There's a lot of verbiage to um, understand and um, a lot of just different words and we'll go through that. So very first, we're gonna just talk about um, real quick, right before chapter 15, um, it starts unit four. It's just kind of a rundown of your nervous system. So we have the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. We've got the peripheral nervous system, which is outside the brain and spinal cord. So that's like the nerves that go to all of our organs and then our peripherals. And it's the autonomic and somatic. So it's the um, basically the, the automatic ones that just do stuff automatically. And then it's the ones that we control, like with um, skeletal movement, muscle movement, stuff like that. Okay. So, um, and then this just says that the peripheral nervous system relieves, uh, receives stimuli and initiates responded, initiates responses um, to those stimuli by the CNS. So that should all just be review for you guys. So here's kind of a, a visual of how it's um, separated. So we have just the the overall nervous system, which is separated into the central and peripheral. Central is the brain and spinal. Here we have the motor sensory. And then we have the autonomic and somatic. And then from the autonomic, we have the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And now that, that is what we're going to, this right here is what we're gonna um, focus on today. The medications that affect that. Okay. So the autonomic nervous system, so there's neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and acetylcholine. So those are the main neurotransmitters that you need to know. They produce con contrast reactions with each other in the same organ. Okay. A drug that mimics the sympathetic nervous system and a drug that blocks the parasympathetic can cause similar responses to the organ. So this is, like I say, this is where people can get things um, a little messed up and it can be a little hard to keep straight. So um, read that a couple times, try to understand that a little bit. Um, many name classifications are given to drugs that mimic or block both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. And we're gonna talk about classification names. And it's, it's kind of like this throughout pharmacology, you're gonna get a lot of different words that mean the same thing. Don't ask me why. I don't know why we all just can't be on the same page and just use one title, but whatever. So here is a visual of um, the parasympathetic nerves and what it does, and then the sympathetic nerves and what they do. So sympathetic is the fight or flight. You remember that. Parasympathetic is the rest and digest. So just even knowing those, um, kind of rhyming schemes, like it kind of will give you, you can kind of work through and kind of figure out, okay, if the parasympathetic nerves are activated, what things are gonna happen? Well, the rest and digest. So when we rest, um, our pupils are gonna constrict, we're gonna you know, wanna eat and digest things. We're gonna wanna like pee and poop and um, do all of like those types of things with resting and digesting. And then on the opposite end, the sympathetic nerves, it's the fight or flight. So here we're running from a bear, a zombie, um, something like that. And, you know, we want our eyes to dilate so that we can see um, more around us. We can kind of take everything in. Um, we want to hold in that pee. We want to hold in that poo. We, you know, our body is where we need, um, you know, our heart rate to go up. We need more energy. We need, you know, all that stuff to be able to um, run from whatever we're running from. 
or fight, fight whatever we decide to fight. Okay, so sympathetic nervous system, here, here's some of the verbiage. It's also called the adrenergic system. Okay, sympathetic, adrenergic, same thing. The neurotransmitter for the sympathetic is norepinephrine. Okay, that's what is going to innervate the smooth muscles. Um, it was once believed to be adrenaline, and has since it's not adrenaline, even though we still kind of refer to it as an adrenaline. Um, you know, get your adrenaline going. It's really get your norepinephrine going. <laughs> That's what we need to change it to. <laughs> so there's four types of adrenergic receptor organ cells. And we talked about this just a little bit when we talked about the non-selective versus non-specific. So this is the alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2. And we're going to get a little more in detail with these um, receptor cells or receptor yeah, I have sector cells. Um, norepinephrine is released from the terminal nerve ending and stimulates the cell receptors to produce a response, which um, a lot of things do that. And then they are activated under different conditions of stress, right? And then it results in the fight or flight response. That's when you get your adrenaline rush, the, you know, feelings of, of that ad adrenaline, which is really norepinephrine. Okay, so here's a visual of a visual. This is your nerve ending right here, right? And this is where um, the norepinephrine is is made, and it's released from this nerve ending. And then here's the cell with the receptors, and it's gonna come through, and it's gonna attach to these alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two receptors. Okay, and that's how your cells it. I mean, I'm sure you guys have all felt adrenaline or, um, you know, had that instant, instant, like, get up and go type feeling. And it's fast. It's fast. And sometimes I, I felt it before, before I even realize what's, you know, before my conscience is even realizing what's happening. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of nurses are adrenaline junkies. Um, you know, I'm one of those. I, I race my cars. So, um, you know, you, you want to, a lot of nurses get into like the high critical care because, you know, you have to be on your toes. You're, you know, things are, are moving, things are happening. And so you, you always get kind of that adrenaline rush, which, you know, what we said is norepinephrine, but <laughs> right, Ashley. Every, during a code blue, I even get it like <laughs> a little bit when they. I mean, I'm on you know sitting on a pediatric unit and they call like a trauma one, and I'm like, ooh, a trauma one, <laughs> or something like that, right? Or you hear a helicopter come in and you're just like, oh, <laughs> so. I bet, Alina, I bet that helped, though, because it um, affects those beta-2 um, receptors, which is the lungs. So, yeah, yeah, rush, rush. Okay. So, here on the other side of the spectrum, we have the parasympathetic nervous system. It's also called the cholinergic, okay? <laughs> so, I know it's a lot of verbiage. You got to keep straight. Um, so also called cholinergics. So in the parasympathetic, where norepinephrine and the sympathetic was the neurotransmitter, acetylcholine in the parasympathetic is the, is the neurotransmitter that we're dealing with. Um, yes, both terms will be used. They're interchangeable. You're going to get, um, and where that comes into play is when we start talking about drugs, they're going to say it's an anticholinergic agonist and, you know, stuff like that. And so it, I know it's, it's a little rough, but I mean, you're going to, they, they're used interchangeably kind of everywhere. So you do need to know all the verb, all the verbiages. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Kylie, that's a great way to remember it. So.
Yeah, cholinergic. Think of your colon and your resting and digesting with the parasympathetic. That's perfect. Um, so there's two receptors. So with the sympathetic, we had the four, right? The alpha one, two, beta one, two. Parasympathetic, we just have two. And it's the nicotinic or the muscarinic. Now, nicotinic, that has nothing to do with nicotine. It's just the name of the um, receptor. Um, but, okay, so acetylcholine comes through, affects the nicotinic or mus muscarinic, however you want to say it, um, receptors. Activated under non-stressful conditions, right? You got home from school or from work and you're like, I am lying on the couch and binging Netflix for the next hour, <laughs> okay? Non-stressful conditions, you're just going to sit there and relax and your body's going to start taking care of everything else. So here's a um, slightly different type of um, picture, but same type of thing. Like here's your nerve ending here. Here's your acetylcholine, which is um, ACH. That's how it's shortened. And then it, you know, it comes out from these nerve endings, affects these things. Now this, um, we're going to talk about what inactivates um these things, right? Because you don't want norepinephrine or acetylcholine just, you know, affecting these receptors all the time, over and over and over. That's when we get into some problems. Um, so there are ways that the norepinephrine and the acetylcholine are deactivated, and I'll talk about those. Here's just another um, picture with the central nervous system. Here we have the autonomic ganglion stuff um, and then here we have the neurotransmitters with the effector organ and the for those visual learners okay this is a great video let me no it's very entertaining and Hopefully, I'm going to probably just have to share my, let's see. Can you guys see that? My screen just kind of went funny. Can you guys see that? And I can't see your comments, so can somebody jump in and. Tell me if you can see this video. No matter what you're a fan of, you can. Anyone see that? I can only see the PowerPoint slide. Okay. Okay. Let's see what I can do here. Hey, Corby. Um, I found the video on YouTube. If you want the link, it's in the chat. Oh, perfect. Geez, you guys are fast with this technology stuff. Crazy fast. And let's share. This is being crazy slow today. Okay, why is it taking? Long. Yes, it might kick me off of here. So if it does, I'll try to come right back. Because <laughs> it's saying like nothing is responding. So hopefully it'll pop back up. Goodness gracious. I 
my my screen is literally frozen. This is not cool. Back, guys. <laughs> I really wish this would just work. Okay, this is how we're going to do it. No matter what you're a fan of, you can probably think of two characters who fit the description. Holmes and Watson, Brennan and Booth, Kirk and Spock, Ron and Hermione. They're close, they understand each other in ways that I...
All right, so that, I think he's pretty entertaining. And so that was a cute little review. Most of that was review. Hopefully almost all of that was review. Um, okay, any questions about the parasympathetic and sympathetic in general? Nothing, okay. Sorry, my camera is still not working. So we'll just continue on until it decides to. Okay. So how would a person who is engaging in stressful or energetic activity benefit from sympathetic effects of bronchodilation, stroke jam, motility, and pupil dilation? Anyone? You're welcome to type in the box or even just Turn on your mic and talk. How do you think that would, with your body, you know, bronchodilating, slowing your GI and dilating your pupils and everything else that it, that the sympathetic does, how is that beneficial? <laughs> Megan, that definitely could be a plus. Right. I mean, me personally, the urge to go to the bathroom just is not pleasant anyway. And so to have to deal with that in a stressful, energetic, whatever type of situation. Somebody's trying to come in my office. Right. It jumps the blood flow to your vital organs, such as heart, lungs, and brain. Right. It increases your blood pressure, increases your heart rate, right? Oh, hold on one sec. What? Hello, friends. Can you hear me? This is Rachel. We're moving over. Yeah. The Great Migration is absolutely correct. Sometimes it does weird stuff. That's so stupid. I know. We're excited to have you over. I miss your face too. I wish you could see me. I've got my sweatband on. Do you remember when we did Sit and Be Fit? It's pretty great. Okay, back. get back to farm. I'm going to help Corby move some things over. <laughs> Yeah, so any, any of that This, stuff. yes? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. It's on my yes. treats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really don't know why this is not working. She does look super cute in her sweatband. And heck, they started moving an hour and a half ago, and I think pretty much almost everything is moved um, except my office <laughs> because I'm in here teaching. <laughs> Most of it's done. It's just it's tiny stuff here and there. Um, the unpacking, that's going to be the fun part. Okay, so yes, yeah, very um, beneficial to have your body, you know, um, give blood to your vital organs, to dilate your eyes so that you can take in more information, more stuff. You can see a little bit better. Um, all that stuff is important energy to be able to do stuff like that. Okay, so that honestly really was, is the review. So if you have any questions about that, um, let me know. Lots of different videos to see. You can get out your anatomy and physiology books, stuff like that. Okay, so now we're going to talk about chapter 15, which is the adrenergic agonist and antagonist. Oh, was there a burden some part? Oh, yes. Sorry. Let's, um, so what type of things might be considered burdensome? I can think of one, the uh, one that we really haven't talked about that still happens with the sympathetic nervous system. I have problems with it when I run. 
Anybody know? Anybody? Any ideas? Sweating. Yes, that's not exactly what I was talking about, though. Urine. So part of the sympathetic is that they hold in your urine. So yeah, I mean, I guess if your uh, sympathetic system is going for so long, um, or maybe too long, you're going to have a problem with that. But what I'm talking about is um, lack of secretions. So the sympathetic, like you're not going to salivate, um, depending on how stressed it is, your sweating actually might be um, limited. But it's it's the salivating that when I'm like running or um, getting like working out or doing some kind of something like that, um, I get a dry mouth <laughs> and I hate it. I have to run with a water bottle because I have to, I, anyway. Dry mouth. I hate that. Anyone else have problems with that? It might just be me. That's fine. Okay. So chapter 15, adrenergic agonists and antagonists. So adrenergic, we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, right? With the fight or flight. Okay. So here we're going to have two... Um, separate things. We have the adrenergic agonists, which stimulate the CNS. It's going to give us the high blood pressure, the dilated pupils, the um, urine retention, stuff like that, right? And then we have the adrenergic antagonist on the other side, which inhibits the CNS. So it's going to inhibit um, the neuro, uh, norepinephrine. We're going to try to prevent those things from happening, okay? Okay. Adrenergics, also known as adrenergic agonists or sympathomimetics. They mimic the sympathetic system, okay? So all of these words, verbiage, try to, try to keep them straight. So located, these um, receptors are located in the heart, the bronchioles, the GI tract, the bladder, the eye, um, also in the urine. Um, uterus um okay receptors are alpha one alpha two beta one beta two those are the main ones we're going to talk about neurotransmitters the norepinephrine right so when adrenergic drugs are administered they produce the classic symptoms of fight or flight we already talked about all those symptoms okay um so when giving adrenergic agonists um, these responses might be considered therapeutic or they might be considered adverse. It kind of, it depends on what we're trying to do, right? Okay, so they act on one or more adrenergic receptor sites located in the effector cells of the muscles of the heart bronchioles, especially in the heart and the bronchioles, and then it, it does affect the GI tract, urinary, blo urinary, uh, urinary bladder, the ciliary, ciliary muscles of the eyes. And then there's some in the, the uterus as well. So here is, this is this picture I know is in your book as well. So you can take a look at that. This just kind of tells you where these alpha-1 receptors are, the alpha-2. Alpha-2 is a, um, an interesting receptor. Uh, this is not like the rest. <laughs> um, so, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but beta one is in the heart and kidneys, beta two is in the lungs. Here's the uterus right here, liver. That kind of gives you an idea of, of where they're at and then what it, ha what it does to them when they are activated. Okay. Okay. So here we go. Adrenergic trans transmission. So, the neurotransmitter obviously is norepinephrine and all of these with the sympathom 
uh, sympathetic system. So alpha one. So a good way to remember this is with the with the ones and the twos. With the ones, you have one heart. So it's going to mostly affect your heart and your blood vessels, right? Um, two, with the beta two, you have two lungs. So that is going to affect your lungs the most, okay? Except for, like I said, alpha two is, it has to deal with the blood vessels and stuff like that, but it does different things. So, and it does the opposite of all these other ones. So alpha one increases the heart contractility, does the vasoconstriction, increases um, blood pressure, dilates the pupils, secretion in salivary glands decreases. Here is um, your urinary bladder relaxation. Um, and then the sphincter contraction increases. So that's where you get your urinary retention. Okay. Alpha 2 is a little different. Um, it, inhibits re it inhibits the release of norepinephrine. It dilates the blood vessels, produces hypotension. This does, like I said, it's a little different. We have drugs that specifically act on alpha-2, um, which we'll talk about. And then beta-1 and beta-2. So beta-1 increases the heart rate, the force of con contraction, the contractility, increases renin secretion, which increases blood pressure. Okay, and then beta-2, we're talking about the lungs with the two lungs. Dilates the bronchioles, promotes gastrointestinal and urine relaxation, promotes increased um, blood glucose, right? So we need the um, energy to do whatever we need to do in times of stress. Um, and, and then it increases the blood flow to the skeletal muscles. So that is kind of, I think. So here we go, alpha receptors cause, cause constriction except for alpha 2 right alpha 1 causes constriction betas causes dilation dilation of the bronchioles right okay um inactivation of neurotransmitters after okay so you know when i said that we don't want norepinephrine or even acetylcholine to sit there and like hang out and keep affecting those cells, right? We we can't be in the fight or flight mode forever, right? We're gonna start having problems if we do, if we're in it forever. So we need, our body needs to stop it at some point. So these are the way they're done, it's done. So they're inactivated by reuptake, either degraded or reused. So sometimes um, the cell or the, the nerve endings will just kind of reabsorb that norepinephrine, okay? There's enzymatic degrada degradation. Um, so different, um, that was in the picture with the acetylcholine, the ACH at, ACHE, that will come in and like degrade it and kind of eat it away and kind of get rid of it, okay? Or there's diffusion away from the receptor, okay? Sometimes, um, we have drugs that will come and kind of protect those receptors and, and make it so that norepinephrine can't reach those receptors. Okay. So some of the enzymes that can um, deactivate this norepinephrine is monoamine oxidase or MAO. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of MAOIs. Those are the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Um, so, but the monoamine oxidase, MAOs, is inside the neuron and it can degrade the norepinephrine. Um, and then the catechol O methyltransferase, COMT, is outside the neuron and it, and, and it inactivates the norepinephrine outside the neuron. Okay. Drugs can prolong the action of the neurotransmitter by inhibiting reuptake or degradation. So, if we, um, like the MAOIs, like I said, if we're taking MAOIs, it's inhibiting that monoamine oxidase, which is therefore that, mo that MAO can't degrade the norepinephrine. So that norepi is just going to sit there and be able to be used again. So it'll be more available. Okay. And that will prolong the action of the neurotransmitter.
Okay. The adrenergic drugs that stimulate adrenergic receptors are classified into three categories according to how they affect the cell. Okay. So here we have direct acting drugs, and they just exactly what they say directly stimulate the adrenergic receptor. Okay. And these are epinephrine or norepinephrine. Okay. Those are the direct acting. Those ones can just go right in those receptors and just. They don't need any help whatsoever. Indirect acting stimulates the release of norepinephrine from the terminal nerve. Okay, so it's saying, so these drugs are coming to this nerve cell saying, make more norepi, make more, make more, make more. It's stimulating this cell or this nerve ending to release more norepinephrine. And then that way, then that norepinephrine can go and, you know, hit on those receptors. So that's an indirect acting. And then there's, of course, the mixed, both indirectly and direct, directly stimulates the receptor by releasing it. Um, so this would be like ephedrine or pseudoephedrine. We've all heard of pseudoephedrine or pseudofed, right? And then ephedrine. Um, these are synthetic, by the way. Um, epinephrine and norepi, they can be synthetic, but we also make them with our bodies, right? They're endogenous. Um, and then here we have the amphetamines, right? Directly or indirect acting. So they're acting on the nerve cell ending, not on the receptors. Okay, so classification of adrenergic agonists. So these are drugs that stimulate the sympathetic system. Okay. They can be classified as catecholamines or non-catecholamines. So catecholamines are the actual chemical structures of the substance. So um, they're endogenous, or like I said, they can be synthetic. Um, but what we're talking about is epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, um, are synthetics or isoperinol, isoproteranol, and then dopamine. These are all, all of these, all of them are destroyed in the intestines and they cannot be given orally. We don't have any type of epinephrine pill or norepinephrine pill. Anytime any of these drugs are given, it's by IV only because the GI system, the stomach will just destroy them automatically, render it useless. Okay, got to keep that in mind. Non-catecholamines stimulate the adrenergic receptors. These are um, more synthetic, these can be given orally. Okay, they extend the duration of action of these um, adrenergic, of the adrenergic system, the sympathetic system. Um, and these are like the ephedrine, albuterol, phenylephrine, pseudoephedrine, all those types of things that can be given orally. And then they help extend, stimulate and extend the sympathetic system. I hope that makes sense. There, okay, so let's see. Okay, so catecholamines are the actual chemical structures of, of a substance. So these are um, endogenous or synthetic synthetics of the endogenous um, chemical. So these are epinephrine, norepi, dopamine. Um, synthetic types are iso... <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I do have problems pronouncing these. Isoproteranol, dopamine. So these are like direct... These are like the actual chemical structures that can directly go in and... Um, affect those receptors. Okay, we we all make epinephrine, we all make norepi and dopamine in our bodies, like automatically. Um, we do, with technology, have some synthetic kinds that we can give that are very um, close to this type of stuff. Um, Non-catecholamines stimulate the receptors. They don't 
necessarily act right on them. These non-catecholamines can be given orally. The di the um, they can be inhaled. Albuterol is inhaled. Um, we've got phenylephrine, like Sudafed pills. We've got Sudafed inhaled um, nasal sprays, stuff like this. So these non-catecholamines um, are all synthetic. Um, I know some of these are synthetic too, but these are ones that can be given orally that can be used um, and extend the duration of action on these receptors. I know it's so, so um, basically like just different classes of these adrenergic adrenergic drugs that we can give. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then, yeah. Um, so the different okay. classifications of the adrenergic agonists. Okay. When you say synthetic, that just means like we make them, right? Like companies. Uh -huh. make them? Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. And we can actually make synthetic epinephrine and norepi. Um, those of you who have maybe worked in the ICU or ER, um, we, you know, you can give epi and norepi and dobutamine. We can give all of these. Our body does make it, but sometimes we need a little bit of a help. So um, we can make those synthetically and, and give them. But non-catecholamines, just remember, these mostly can be just given orally. They're not destroyed as easily as the actual chemical structures. So Corby, on that yeah. kind of going back to slides where we have like the direct acting, indirect and mixed. So would those classify under catecholamines or non-catecholamines or is that just use like how they actually work? This is how, yeah, this is how they work. So, so this would really be like the functioning can be direct acting, indirect or mixed. And then the classification would actually be catecholamines and non-catecholamines? Well, your book has both of these under classifications. So um, I, I think that's two different ways to classify them. Does that make sense? So they can be classified this way or they could be classified this way. Okay. I, I know I, I do understand it is confusing. <laughs> I I fully understand that. <laughs> I totally get it. And even the guy in the video was like, I know this is confusing. Um, but yeah, under um, in your book, under classifications, it says that it can be classified with how they act or it can be classified as catecholamines and non-catecholamines. Okay. So... Now, here we go, more classifications, I know. Now we have the non-selective versus selective. So we, we already talked about, yeah, Alina, I guess that's a good way. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. And then, and now this way it's classifying it on um, how many receptors it affects. So yeah, different ways to ca to classify them. I guess it's kind of like vegetables. You can have vegetables that um, are like, you know, your leafy vegetables versus your non-leafy vegetables, or you can go, you know, your green vegetables versus your colored vegetables, or just kind of like that. It's just like different ways of um, classifying kind of the same thing. So now we're talking about receptors. So we have the non-selective receptors, which is kind of exactly what it says. It's not gonna, it doesn't care, it's non-selective. It's just gonna kind of affect everything. So we've got the alpha one, beta one, and beta two with the epinephrine. Okay. Um, and then you have your selective, which would be your albuterol, which says, you know, I really like beta two the best. I wanna pick that one. <laughs> so. That's the one that alpha, the albuterol chooses to um, affect. So albuterol selective, our epinephrine is um, non-selective. So it, it affects more than just one. You have your side effects of epi of 
So with the side effects, think about, okay, so if I give epi, it's going to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. What does the sympathetic do? Okay, it increases blood pressure. So one of the side effects is going to be hypertension, right? It increases heart rate. So one of the side effects is going to be tachycardia. Um, you can get palpitations, restlessness, tremors, dysrhythmia, dizziness. Here's your urinary retention. All these things are expected. Now, it just kind of depends on how long you're taking it um, and how much. And then we can get into the adverse effects, right? Um, so treatment here, um, you're going to use epi for anaphylaxis, cardiac arrest, and then shock. And that's why you're going to use the, the epinephrine. Um, and that includes like the EpiPens. That's epinephrine. That's a shot. Okay, so... Um, one thing to think about, um, I worked at Primary Children's, I don't know if I told you this, I think I did. I worked at Primary Children's in the pediatric intensive care unit and as a pharmacy tech. So I saw a lot of things. And so what do you think? If, if somebody's on epinephrine for a long time, kind of think about what it does. What do you think, what kind of adverse effects are you going to start seeing if they're on it for a long time? Anyone think of something? Heart failure, yeah. Uh, I haven't heard about Tremors becoming permanent. So in this situation with the, the girl I'm thinking of, um, so what happened was she um, got strep throat and um, wasn't ever treated. And so she got really, really sick, went into septic shock. So came in, she was intubated, and was on epi and norepi and do, um, dobutamine, all that stuff for a long time because she was so sick. Um, so think about like your, um, your vasoconstriction. So this is kind of, with meds, this is kind of how you have to, um, think sometimes to try to figure out if like if you're having an adverse effect or how this how this drug's gonna gonna affect you so taylor yes if she wasn't if we weren't if they weren't regulating her um blood glucose yeah you could get hypoglycemia because your body's trying to um make enough um glucose, right? And if you don't have enough, then you could go into that. But so with fight or flight, right? Somebody back there, oh, sorry, I don't remember who it was. Somebody talked about how you, it shunts all the blood to your vital organs. So if you have all your blood being shunted to your vital organs, which is what we wanted in the first place, because she was in septic shock. I mean, her, she was going into organ failure and we needed that. But what happens to your fingers and your toes and your peripherals? Does your body care about that? Does anything bigger? Right. Absolutely. So her um, fingers and toes started dying because it didn't have any blood supply. But her vital organs needed it worse. Does that make sense? So this poor, this poor girl actually ended up losing um, her feet because, uh, because of how sick she was. So things like that, if you're on medications for a long time, you got to kind of start thinking like that. Okay. What does this do to the body? You know, it vasoconstricts. We want everything into the, to the core of the body. Now what's going to happen to the peripherals? 
So yeah, she did end up losing her feet. Um, and sweet thing was a cheerleader. Oh, felt so bad for her. And she was a sweet, sweet girl. Lived, she lived, but um, side effects and adverse effects to a lot of things. But I mean, if, if she wouldn't have had all that medicine and stuff, she probably would have died. So anyway, sad slash happy story, I guess. I don't know. Okay, let's see. Selective albuterol does the two side effects with that is tremors, restlessness, nervousness. Now, if you get albuterol, if you get a lot of albuterol, um, sometimes you can be on continuous albuterol. Um, now, it does mostly affect the beta two. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna get the the bronchial dilation, um, all that stuff, but it will affect your beta one, which will increase your heart rate. So don't be surprised if somebody's taking a lot of albuterol if they're tachycardic, because that does happen. You're gonna be restless, tremors, shaky. <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> All you potential uh, pediatric nurses with the kids that take a lot of albuterol for the asthma, they'll be, you'll see them just in the bed, just shaking. <laughs> it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. So with these ones, you want to be, um, they're treated for asthma and COPD. And because we want to bronchodilate, right? Okay. So now we have non other non-selective adrenergic agonists. So other drug in the non-selective category is dopamine, um, used to treat hypotension, heart failure, hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock. Um, it's only administered via, via IV, like we said before. Pseudoephedrine, used to treat nasal congestion, right, and allergic rhinitis. Um, contraindicated in hypertension, right, because it's going to make it worse. Um, cardiac disease, emphysema, and if you already have urinary retention, it's going to make that worse too. Um, ephedrine, used to relieve hypotensive states, respiratory congestion, narcolepsy, prevent bron bronchospasm in asthma patients. Was used for weight loss at one time, but now um, it's illegal in the U.S. to do that. And then norepi uh, for hypotension, cardiogenic shock, septic shock. Um, now, don't be confused. Norepinephrine can be a drug, but it's also the sympathetic nervous system neurotransmitter. Okay. Um, and then with all of these, you're going to want to monitor their blood pressure, heart rhythm. Um, it causes urinary retention, so you want to monitor their eyes and nose, um, stuff like that. These also, all these ones that are given IV with the, the um, epinephrine, norepi, dopamine, dopamine, all those given IV can cause um, problems with the vein. And so you'll want to check the IV site very often. Okay, selective adrenergic agonists. Here you have your albuterol, your dobutamine, terbutaline. Right, well, I talked about the uterus. This um, helps relax that uterus, so it'll help stop preterm labor. Right, when you're in the fight or flight, you don't want to be given a baby. <laughs> you don't want to be. You don't want to be in labor having a baby. So it'll relax the uterus, um, and so that helps prevent preterm preterm labor. Um, this is off-label off use. It's used a lot, um, which kind of makes me wonder if there's been studies done since recently. Okay, so epinephrine, it's a sympathomimetic or adrenergic agonist or sympathetic nervous system stimulant, whatever you want to call it. It all works the same. It affects both beta one, beta two, and then the alpha one it has some alpha stuff on there. Um, it can cause paradoxal bronchospasms with excessive use of the inhalers. Okay, all these other good things that it can cause. It can cause tissue necrosis at the IV site, so be careful. Um, do not let your IVs infiltrate. 
Um, let's see. Cardiac tachydysrhythmias. Um, if you already have this stuff, you don't want to be taking more ephedrine. Epinephrine. Glaucoma is going to be big. Don't use in glaucoma. You need to know that. Um, caution and be careful with if they already have hypertension, um, hypothyroidism, pregnancy, diabetes, right? Because it does affect their blood sugar. Um, let's see. And add, this is kind of, I mean, if you think about it, it makes sense. An additive um, effect if given with other adrenergic agents. So you're going to add on to that effectiveness, which is might be wanted, might not be wanted. Um, hypertensive crisis if given with MAO eyes. Okay, um, beta blockers can affect how this is, if, depending on how you're giving it, what responses you want to see. And then um, enhanced pressure response when given with tricyclic antidepressants. So all these good things to know, nursing responsibilities that you want to remember. Um, you want to give it per the guidelines, per doctor's orders, monitor the vital signs. Monitor the IV site, have them on an ECG, uh, telemetry, report any side effects. You want to watch their eyes and nose, right? And then watch for toxicity and overdose. A lot of things, a lot of things to think about when given these things. Okay, so here's just another visual. Here's epinephrine. It affects the alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2, and this is what it does. It'll increase blood pressure, increase your heart rate, and relax your bronchioles so you can breathe better. Okay, that was a lot of information. Healthcare provider pre prescribes epinephrine to a patient who was stung by several wasps 30 minutes ago. Nurse knows the primary purpose of this medication for the patient is to stop systemic release of histamine, counteract the formation of antibodies, Increase the number of white blood cells, increase the declining blood pressure, and dilate constricting bronchi associated with anaphylaxis. What do we think? Y'all awake? <laughs> Okay, so a few of you. All right, so let's go. So through, let's talk about one. So stop the systemic. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Good one, Steph. <laughs> okay, stop the systemic release of histamine produced by the mast cell. So we're talking about epinephrine. Okay, we know what type of receptors epinephrine does. It doesn't release or inhibit anything. So um, it's the epinephrine is a direct acting, right? So it's going to directly act on these receptors. It's not going to inhibit anything. It's not going to stop anything. Um, so stop the systemic release of histamine produced by the mast cells. I'm not going to do anything with histamine. We haven't even talked about histamine. So that is not um, the correct answer. Counteract the formation of antibodies in response to an invading antigen. This doesn't do anything with antibodies. Um, it's a medication that just directly sticks on a, on a receptor and makes a response, right? Tells the cells to do a response. So as far as blood and antibodies, it's not going to do anything with that. Same with three, increase the number of white blood cells. It doesn't do anything to um, like the bone marrow, doesn't do anything with the white blood cells or antibodies or anything like that. So it's not gonna do that. Um, increase the declining blood pressure and dilate constricting bronchi associated with anaphylaxis. So what do we know that epi does? It does, um, it increases the heart rate 
increases the blood pressure and dilates the bronchi. Okay, and that's exactly what this is doing. When, um, if you're in anaphylactic shock long enough, you will go into hypovolemic shock as well because your vessels are going to like dilate and so your blood pressure is going to go down, right? And we want all that to come up. So, and it's anaphylaxis. So that's one of the ways or one of the treatments for one of the treatments for anaphylaxis is epinephrine. Okay. So here's a medication chart for albuterol. This is the beta-2 adrenergic agonist. Um, it's a bronchodilator, stimulates the beta-2. Now, like I said before, if taken in enough amounts, it will stimulate some of that beta-1 and increase the heart rate, okay? So, you can get palpitations, tachycardia, hypertension, infection, hyperglycemia, hypokalemia, cardiac dysrhythmia, angioedema, bronchospasm, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, all these things potentially. Um, contraindications, if you have heart disease, already have hypertension, cardiac dysrhythmias, or um, CAD, diabetes, um, renal dysfunction, at advanced A seizure, and male therapy. Okay, so some of these contraindications, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, I'm sure there's at least one person in this group of 41 that knows somebody that has diabetes, that either has or does have, a, have asthma or something and has taken albuterol. Okay, so... With these contraindications, it doesn't necessarily mean they cannot use it, period. It just means that if they have diabetes or if they have heart disease or if they have some of these things going on and they're given albuterol, they need to be watched a little more closely. And that's especially true with beta blockers that we're going to talk about. Obviously, if this stimulates the beta too and then we're taking beta blockers on top of it, it's not going to work. And so um, a lot of my a lot of my students last semester were like, hey, this patient's taking this med and this med, but they're contraindicated together. It it depends on the patient, how the drug affects them, how severe their diseases are, um, benefits outweigh the risks. So um, just know in these contraindications, they just need to be watched more closely because more adverse effects or more things can happen. Um, you know, if you have a, a diabetic patient that is prescribed albuterol and it's new, some of the teaching might be, hey, this can cause um, a little fluctuation in your sugar. You can get um, hyperglycemia with this. So when you're taking this med, check your blood sugars more frequently until you know how to affect them. Does that make sense? So some of these contraindications help with teaching as well. So I hope that kind of explains things. Drug interactions, obviously adrenergic agonists. Here we have beta blockers, right? Um, potassium stuff, caffeine. That is cut off. What does that say? Hold on. Oh, yeah, can increase the stimulant effect. So if they're like jittery and anxious and tremors and they're taking caffeine, that might increase the tremors and jitteriness and anxiousness, nervousness, stuff like that. It can increase it. Okay, so with albuterol, if you're giving albuterol for your patient, probably going to be doing something with the lungs, right? So you want to assess the lung sounds frequently. Um, Blood pressure, pulse, because it can cause the tachycardia, right? Monitor their pulmonary function tests. Uh, monitor for any type of paradoxical bronchospasms. Their blood sugar and potassium. And then just have them be careful to read um, over-the-counter meds for those MAOIs and TCAs. These right here. Okay. <coughs> okay. 
Okay. So the patient takes a dose of albuterol prior to bedtime. What effect would the nurse consider normal for this drug? So we've got insomnia, sleepiness, urticaria, or tinnitus. Oh my gosh. X galore. Only two responses out of 40? Do we need to do some jumping jacks? <laughs> okay. okay, a little more. Right, insomnia, right? Because it's going to increase the blood pressure. Not the blood pressure. It's going to increase the heart rate. Um, it's going to, you know, make them anxious, nervous, tremors. It's not necessarily to relax them at all. I'm not going to relax them. Although sometimes it's needed at night. Okay, do you guys want to take a break? We're going, let's take a 10 minute break before we talk about our central acting alpha agonist. So let's take, should we say a 15 minute break? Let's go to 1130. And okay, so let's continue. This is going a little slower than I'd hoped, <laughs> but we'll get through it. Okay, so we talked about alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2, and how I said the alpha-2 is different. It's a little zebra in this herd of horses. So here is when we talk about alpha-2. Uh, your book calls it a central acting, these meds, central acting alpha agonist. And we're going to talk about clonidine and methyl dopa. So clonidine and methadopa, they, they both act on alpha-2. They're both alpha-2 adrenergic agonists. Clonidine is primarily to treat hypertension. If you um, activate those alpha-2 receptors, you're going to get the vasodilation, right? Um, it decreases the release of norepinephrine, so it's going to um, make it so you don't have as much norepi. Right, so you're not going to vasoconstrict, do all that stuff that B will do. So it'll it primarily given with hypertension. You don't see this quite as often as you would, um, like a beta blocker, or calcium channel blocker, or something like that. But it is it is given, and it can produce some bradycardia and sed some sedation too. So just remember those methyl dopa is one that we're going to talk about in the next uh, week or so, next week or the week after um, with Alzheimer's so or Parkinson's disease. So methadopa is an alpha adrenergic, adrenergic agonist that acts within the CNS. It decreases the sympathetic outflow from the CNS, reduces peripheral resistance, causing vasodilation, and a reduction in blood pressure. Okay, it's not as, it's, this really isn't used as an antihypertensive um, because other antihypertensive drugs are better. Um, this is with fewer side effects. Some just act on the body better. Um, but methyl dopa we'll talk about with um, Parkinson's disease. But these are the two central acting alpha agonists that work on the alpha 2. Okay. So adrenergic antagonists. So what we've talked about before were adrenergic agonists. So that's with the epinephrine and the uh, albuterol. So now we're going to talk about adrenergic antagonists. They're also called adrenergic blockers or sympatholytics. Okay. So they block the, the alpha and beta receptors by a couple of ways. They directly occupy the receptor. So the norepi can't even get in there, or they inhibit the release of the neurotransmitter. Okay, so those are the two ways that the antagonists work. They're very similar to cholinergic agonists, which we're going to talk about um, with our PNS. Um, most often used for hypertension. Um, so we have the alpha adrenergic antagonists and the beta adrenergic antagonists. I don't. It's like a tongue twister. I wish my cam would work. Okay, so alpha adrenergic antagonists. 
So drugs that block or inhibit the response at the alpha adrenergic receptors, okay? So these block the alphas. Now these groups, <laughs> this alpha group is now divided into two more groups. So I wish my camera would show you. I would show you my, um, I have a, um, a chart that I had written out, just really following just the book. And it takes it, and it's kind of like a, kind of like a family chart, like how you have your parent and it splits up into your, you know, into the kids and then those kids get married and split and have kids. And so that's kind of how I've made mine where you have your adrenergic antagonists um, and then you have your alpha and your beta that break off. But then under the alpha, you have your selective and non-selective. Does that, I wish I could show you. Does that, am I explaining things well? <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, Megan, the problem with just uploading a copy of what I've done is I really, really honestly think that you guys would benefit making your own. Because in your... Um, you know, you're reading the, the information, you're making your own chart, you're able to write it down or draw it out, and it really will help you. Um, it will really help you study. I feel like if I just give you what I've done, it just kind of, I don't know, I don't think it'll benefit you quite as much. Does that make sense? So I want you guys to try to make your own if you feel like that will... Um, help you, but um, anyway, so that's that's kind of a method that I've used to help to help me remember all of this. Now, on the alpha blocking agents, we have the selective. That might be something we can do, Amy. Um, <clears throat> I'll think about it. Okay, so the alpha blocking agents are block are separated again into selective alphas and non-selective alphas. So obviously the selective alphas will only block, you know, alpha one. Non-selective will block alpha one and alpha two. Okay. The most important effects of an alpha adrenergic antagonist are to the cardiovascular system, right? Because that the heart and the vessels is really what alpha one does. Okay, and then selective alpha one antagonists are primarily used to treat hypertension. Um, and also because um, the sympathetic nervous system can cause urinary retention, it these antagonists help decrease symptoms of the benign prostatic hyperplasia, the BPH. So that will help with um, urinary retention as well. There's my, I lost, I lost my uh, pointer, my mouse. Alpha adrenergic antagonist also helps with Raynaud's disease because Raynaud's disease is vasospasms of the vessels. And so if you're um, blocking any type of vasoconstriction that can happen, it will help um with the peripheral circulation okay and um just a recap of, of Raynaud's disease it's a peripheral um circulation problem most most of the time with fingers can happen with toes um a lot of things can set it off like emotional stress cold temperatures can exa exacerbate this and then, so the alpha ones can diminish the vasospasms, can prevent the vasoconstriction. And um, this, this condition can be really painful because it's kind of like, I mean, if you cut off your circulation to your finger, if anybody's had like a ring get stuck or, um, you know, if you've tied string around your finger and you've let it go purple and white, like it hurts. It hurts when you don't have circulation where you're supposed to. So this can be pretty painful. So alpha 
the alpha adrenergic antagonists will help treat this, this um, disorder. Okay, so other drugs in, that are alpha adrenergic antagonists, these are prazosin, um, used for hypertension and your BPH. Um, let's see, the first dose phenomenon can cause them to be, that's with some of um, other, a lot of hypertension drugs can, you need to be careful with um, potential syncope. Doxazosin, you've got the tem, temsilosin, the Flomax, um, which helps with urinary retention. Um, it also, you'll see Flomax a lot with like kidney stones. People with kidney stones will be prescribed Flomax. Um, and then phentolamine. That is the antidote for dopamine, dopamine, da 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 da. Oh, yeah, actually, that's my watch. So let me see what I can do with my watch. Sorry. I usually don't have this problem. Good laws. Let's see. There we go. Sorry, Mark. Okay, so... All right, uh, just other drugs to know if, if that are in that group. Okay, so here you guys have probably seen some of these um, drawings and stuff to kind of help uh, remember drugs and diseases and stuff like that. So here's one for you with the alpha adrenergic antagonist um, with their side effects, some of the drugs that are um, included in that to help you remember. Okay, so wake up question. To avoid the first dose phenomenon that we talked about with prezosin, the nurse knows that the initial dose of prezosin should be... So let me just kind of explain first dose phenomenon a little bit. We didn't really go into that a whole lot. But um, sometimes with these antihypertensive drugs, the first dose can actually drop your blood pressure more than you expect. If you're hearing that ding, that was not me. That was outside the door. <laughs> um, so let's see. Okay. So if you're worried about, um, you got to think, okay, so first dose phenomenon, that's when if you're giving it for hypertension, you'll get low blood pressure, right? You'll get some hypo, um, hypotension. Wow, sorry guys, I got something in my throat. Okay, so with hypotension, you can get some syncope, right? So if we double the dose, we're probably going to make the first dose phenomenon even worse. Okay, so we're, our, our hypotension is going to get even worse. The syncope is going to get worse. And then given it breakfast, we're going to be dealing with this hypotension for a while, right? So not, you know, this person's going to want to get up and go about their business and go about their day. And if they're having hypotension and some syncope, that's not going to be a, a good fit. So um, the first dose, we want it to be very low and given at breakfast. So if we give a lower dose, the, the first dose phenomenon won't be quite so bad, right? Because we have less medication in our system. But if it still happens, if we still do get a little bit of syncope or a little bit of hypotension, um, that's going to be also a problem with breakfast. Okay. So um, because they're going to be done with this, you know, getting up, getting dressed, we don't want them to, to fall. So a low dose given at bedtime um, is probably the best bet 
you could probably do a usual dose given at bedtime, but if this is the first dose, I think we're still trying to figure out what dose would be good for the patient. So a low dose given at bedtime, um, if they do get syncope, they're already laying down, right? They're hypotension. What do we want when people are hypotensive to lie down, right? We don't want them up and moving around. So three is probably the best um, answer for this. Okay, so neurotransmitters, um, adrenergic versus neuro, um, cholinergic. This slide probably should have been up taller, up higher when we were talking about both of them um, with the norepinephrine and acetylcholine. So I'll fix that. I'll slip that up farther, um, closer to the beginning. So here is another um, I guess, way to um, put in the alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2s. Their locations, their actions are there, um, kind of what we expect when they're um, either, when they're activated, what we're looking for, and then when they're inactivated, like if we have an antagonist jumping on, then it's going to do the opposite. Like we have a beta blocker, so we're blocking the beta. So if beta increases heart contractility, then we're going to start decreasing heart contractility with beta blockers. It's gonna decrease the heart rate with beta blockers, right? We're not gonna get the bronchodilation with the beta blockers um, and stuff like that. So that's just another way to put it all together. Okay, and now our beta adrenergic agonists and antagonists, I apologize for that. Beta adrenergic antagonists. Okay, so these, like I said, are called, we talked about before, beta blockers. That's the most common, how they're most commonly known as. They decrease the heart rate and the blood pressure. Okay, here we have non selective and selective. Okay, our non selective is going to be both beta 1 and beta 2, so it's going to affect the heart and the lungs. Okay, they're prescribed to treat hypertension, angina, cardiovascular disorders. You're gonna, we're going to talk about beta blockers in multiple sections. When we talk about hypertension and angina, we're going to bring up beta blockers again. Um, we're going we're gonna to see beta blockers quite often. Um, use caution in patients who have COPD or asthma. Um, propranolol is the prototype. It was the first beta blocker prescribed to treat angina, cardiac dysrhythmias, hypertension, heart failure. Who else knows? We talked about propranolol before, actually. Who else can tell me what else it can treat? Anyone remember with our last section what propranolol can treat as well? Anyone getting a gold star? So what types of things did we talk about last in unit three? Corby, can you hear me? Uh-huh. Um, does it have an effect on like saving kidneys? Saving kidneys? Yeah, like um, if they're damaged, like, or is that ACE inhibitors? It's one of the two that like protects kidneys. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's going to be your ACE inhibitors. Those work on the RAS, oh, okay. the RAS system. Yeah. Yeah, so Olivia got it. Headaches. Works really well with headaches and even some migraines. So people with um, really debilitating headaches, and they don't even necessarily have to be debilitating. They can be just severe. Um, they can try propranolol with headaches. So, yep, that's one of your adjunct therapies right there. Now, propranolol, with being a prototype medication, has a lot, not a, has some side effects to it as well. So, selective adrenergic ant antagonists have a greater affinity to certain receptors, right? Because they're selective, and they can be used to decrease pulse rate and blood pressure. 
So our beta blockers are going to end in this lull. Um, this says O lull, but most of them are not all of them have this O. So they'll be in the lulls. So we've got like propranolol, atenolol, carvedilol, all of these lulls, they're all going to be beta blockers, which helps remembering not all drugs are like that. <laughs> but it does help. So any pretty much any medication you see with a lull um, is going to be a beta blocker. Okay, we got metoprolol, um, labetalol, natalol, pindalol, sotalol. So they're all lols. They're going to decrease heart rate, decrease force of contractility. Um, side effects, they can cause some bradycardia, right? They're decreasing heart rate. So if it's too much, you could get bradycardia. You get some lethargy, GI disturbance. Um, um, some heart failure, maybe, depending on the dose and how long you're on it, decreased blood pressure, depression, some of these things. Um, now, with the propranolol, with the prototype drug and other drugs that come after it, the prototype usually has the most side effects, and then you improve upon that, try to make them better and take some side effects off. So you'll see slight differences in side effects depending on the medication, but most, most often, pretty much as a whole, you'll see these types of things potentially. So here's a tenolol. Um, Tenolol is another one of the prototypes. Um, so one thing to know with beta blockers, and this is pretty much all beta blockers, they have this black box warning. Remember, black box means potential life threatening. Black box warning is if you abruptly stop these medications, you can have big problems. <laughs> um, so you. These medications can't be stopped. They have to be tapered off. Okay. Um, let's see. Hold on. So if, if they're abruptly stopped, um, you can get some severe tachycardia, severe hypertension, um, and severe angina, dysrhythmias, and it can cause a heart attack. So you want to be careful with um, patients on these medications that they don't stop, just abruptly stop these medications. They need to be tapered off. If they decide they don't want to take it anymore, they should just be tapered off. So a lot of things on here, use caution with patients with diabetes and renal failure, um, some, a lot of drug interactions. So nursing responsibilities, you're going to want to monitor the blood pressure, the pulse, the heart rate, and rhythm, okay? Assess for compliance. You need to know if they're taking them and how they're taking them. Um, monitor your eyes and nose, signs of overdose. Um, Stuff like that. Okay, other beta adrenergic antagonists. See how these are alls? Carvedilol, labetalol, propranolol. A lot of these are for hypertension. Some of them are for angina or heart failure. Um, uh, treatment for MIs. Here's your migraine prophylaxis right here with the propranolol. And then here's one of those drawings again to help with the beta um, adrenergic antagonist. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, wake up question. A patient has started on propranolol. What is the most important action to be included in the plan of care for this patient related to this medication? So. Here you want to watch this question, which is the most important? So all of these, or potentially more than one, are going to be important to know. But we want to know which is the most important. If you had to tell um, 
include just one in your plan of care or in your teaching or whatever it may be, if you only had one, which one would be the most important? Okay, perfect. Perfect, you guys all got it. You wanna monitor your pulse and your blood pressure, right? Because that's what it's gonna affect most. Okay, elevate head of bed during meals. It's not necessarily gonna affect your swallowing. Take medication after meals, doesn't matter. And then consume high in potassium, consume foods high in potassium. We're good there. So the most important is the pulse and blood pressure. Okay. Do you guys want to do lunch now? Do you want to keep going for a hot minute? Do lunch later? What are what are your thoughts? So that is chapter fifteen on our sympathetic um, system, and then we're going to go on to chapter sixteen, which is our parasympathetic. We take a poll. So I've got 64 slides total and we're on 45. Do you want to post to keep going? How about we save that? Okay. All right. Let's just power through this real quick. Okay. I know it seems like a whole lot of information, but guys, these chapters aren't really very long. A lot of them are tables and pictures and stuff. So let's run through this. So we talked about our, our sympathetic. Now we're gonna go into our parasympathetic. Okay, so we talked about how um, parasympathetic, we have our cholinergics, they're also known as cholinergic agonists or parasympathomimetics. Okay. Located in the smooth muscle in the skeletal. Receptors are the muscaneric and nicotinic. So that kind of tells you where they're at. Um, our neurotransmitter, remember, is acetylcholine. Um, when col Oh, there's an L right there. They're supposed to be. Typo, sorry. When cholinergic drugs are administered, they produce the classic symptoms of rest and digest, okay? Cholinesterase destroys acetylcholine. So that was the ACAG we talked about right here. This ACAG right there in that picture. So with our, when our, with our cholinergic agonists, we're going to split off and we have direct acting and indirect acting, okay? So they act on, so direct acting, directly act on the receptor. So this D right here is like the drug. So the drug comes in, directly acts on those receptors. Okay. Indirect acting in, inhibits the actions of the enzyme cholinesterase by forming a chemical complex that allows acetylcholine to persist and attach to the receptors. So these, this drug comes in and takes and deactivates this enzyme, which will, if not deactivated, degrade this acetylcholine. Does that make sense? So those are, that's how those work. Cholinergic agonists, the major responses of cholinergic agonists are to stimulate bladder and GI tone, meiosis, or increase neuromuscular transmission. Other effects of these cholinergic ag agonists are to Decrease heart rate and blood pressure, increase salivary, uh, increase saliva, GI and bronchial glandular secretions. Um, these are used to treat urinary retention, neurogenic bladders, and GERD. And then your side effects, hypotension, blurred vision, maybe underline that, blurred vision, make a note, blurred vision, Excessive salivation. Okay, so cholinergic agonists. So effects of cholinergic agonists on the cardiovascular system, we're going to decrease the heart rate and blood pressure. 
Okay, gastrointestinal, increase the tone and motility. Um, we want that to, to start working. And um, increase peristalsis and relax the, sphinx, the sphincter muscles. Okay, Gen genital, you're, you're, I'm having a really hard time. My mouth is dry. Genital urinary, um, contraction of the bladder muscles, Increase tone of the ureters, relax bladder sphincter muscles, and stimulate urination. In the ocular, we want um, increased meiosis, increased accommodation. Uh, glandular, increased salivation, perspiration, and tears. Um, bronchial, we want to um, smooth bronchial muscle contraction, increase bronchial secretions. And then in the muscle, Increase neuromuscular transmission and maintenance of muscle strength and tone. Okay, so this, these are all the systems that um, the parasympathetic affects. Um, okay, so one of your meds, bethanocol chloride, it's a cholinergic. This is used for urinary tract stimulation. So it promotes contraction of the bladder, which in turn is going to help us pee. It does increase GI secretions and peristalsis, um, pupillary constriction and bronchoconstriction. Okay, so adverse effects, you can get some tachycardia, tachycardia um, weakness and bronchospasms. Um, contraindications, intestinal or urinary tract obstruction, right, if we have a blockage of bowel blockage and we're trying to increase peristalsis, that's not going to work. Contraindication with that. IBS, bradycardia, um, hypotension, COPD, and asthma because you get that bronchoconstriction. Peptic ulcers, hypothyroid seizures. Drug interactions decreases effects with antidysrhythmics. Um, some antidysrhythmics are beta blockers. Um, atropine, and opioid, opiates counteract action, right? Opiates, we know, causes constipation. It slows the GI peristalsis. So, of course, that would contraindicate or that would counteract this medication, especially if we're using it to increase peristalsis. Increases AST, bilirubin, amylase, and lipase. So you want to monitor your blood pressure, pulse, respirations, your eyes and nose, um, right? Monitor labs, and then if you're giving this to for um, GI stuff, you're going to want want to monitor like bowel sounds, stuff like that. Other drugs, um, you've got your metoclopramide which is an anti-nausea medication. Um, it can also be used, just an FYI, to increase um, breast milk supply. But anyway, most of the time, decreases nausea and vomiting, increases gastric emptying, and is given to treat GERD and gastroparesis. This, um, I can't recall if I put this med on your to know list, but um, recognize it because you'll see it in the hospital. Arbacol treats the IOP and glaucoma. Pilocarpine treats glaucoma by relieving intraocular pressure. Okay, and then an oral form of this pilocarpine can um, help relieve dry mouth. And then the pyrodis, pyro, pyridostigmine um, will visit this med again when we talk about myasthenius gravis, but it also helps with urinary retention and anilius. Other drugs to know. The nurse is monitoring the patient for which of the common adverse side effects associated with the thanacol. So what do you think? We've got abdominal discomfort, sweating, flush skin, blurred vision, constipation. Do we need to go back and see what? Let's see.
So this doesn't spell it out, but you can kind of look. Any other guesses? Any other thoughts? Okay, we've got a couple more responses. So, knowing, let's see, so we've got what, it, what it's going to do is promote contraction of the bladder, increase peristalsis, pupillary constriction, and bronchoconstriction. So, we go back, if you're increasing the peristalsis of, of your gut, that can actually cause um, abdominal discomfort. So that could definitely be a common side effect. Sweating, flushed skin, constipation, blurred vision. Megan, you mentioned five. That could definitely be um, a side effect you're going to watch for with the pupillary constriction. But I would think that the, that, um, the most common side effect would be the abdominal discomfort. Okay, cholinergic antagonists. So these also have more than one name. So we've got cholinergic blocking agents, muscarinic antagonist, anticholinergic, which is used a lot, antispasmodics, or parasympatholytics. That's a mouthful. So we talked about where they're located in the heart, bronchioles, GI tract, bladder, eyes, exocrine glands, the receptors, um, muscarinic receptors for these antagonists. Um, not so much the nicotinic for these guys. Um, they occupy receptor sites inhibiting acetylcholine from acting. Um, and then they can act as an antidote to cholinesterase inhibitors. That all makes sense. <laughs> okay. Cholinergic antagonists. So these are drugs that inhibit the actions of acetylcholine. So they, they occupy the receptor so the acetylcholine can't go and get in there. Okay. They're called cholinergic antagonists. Um, there's another typo right there. Sorry about that. Um, muscarinic antagonists, anticholinergics, cholinergic blocking agents. These are just, I'm just saying the, the words over again. Um, and then major body tissues, again, heart, respiratory, GI, bladder, eyes. I know it's, it's a lot of repetition, but um, sometimes it can be really hard to keep the different cholinergics, anticholinergics, um, and then the adrenergics, all that stuff. So I think repetition helps. The major responses in anticholinergics are decreased in GI motility, right? We're antagonists are going to do the opposite of agonists. So agonists increase bladder con contraction, increase motility, did all of that stuff. Now we're antagonists. Now we're going to do the opposite. We're going to decrease the bladder contraction, um, decrease rigidity and tremors, um, decrease salivation. We're going to dilate the eyes, um, stuff like that. And then um, antihistamines are in this group because they're atropine like drugs and they dry up. So um, decrease in secretions. So antihistamines do that. So they're, they're, in this group. Okay, so what cholinergic antagonists do to all the systems um, in large doses, your heart rate will increase. Um, the tone of the GI tract will be relaxed and, you know, you're not going to get as much peristalsis. 
um, your gastric and intestinal reflexes are decreased. So these are a lot like um, the adrenergics, right? So these are very similar to the actions of adrenergics. This is kind of your, your, um, your fight or flight type responses, right? Because you get the increased heart rate, the decreased GI motility, the relaxed bladder, decreased salivation, right? Your bronchi are dilated. So this is very similar to your um, adrenergics. Okay, some anticholinergic impacts on the body. So you can get your dry eyes, blurred vision, dry mouth, um, upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, constipation, um, your dry skin, flush skin, uh, difficult urination, right? These are all very similar to your sympathetic system being activated. Atropine is one of these um, cholinergic antagonists. You're going to see this um, in a couple different ways. Um, you can give this when um, sometimes they give you atropine drops, eye drops at the doctor's office to dilate your pupils. Okay. Um, you can also see atropine given in code situations um, to decrease secretions um, and then just decreasing secretions in general. If somebody has hyper secretions, you can give atropine. Um, those are probably the two most common ways I've seen it is either eye drops to dilate the eyes or like in a, in a code or rapid response type situation where this patient has a lot of secretions, we want to dry them up. Okay. Um, oh no. <laughs> Megan, that's no fun. <laughs> oh shoot. Okay, so increased effect with antihistamines. Remember, we talked about antihistamines were in this group because it helps dry up TCAs, phenothiazines. Okay, so assess vital signs in the ECG, right? Monitor your eyes and nose. Assess for abdominal distension and bowel sounds because it, it is a cholinergic antagonist. It's going to decrease your GI mo motil motility. Yeah, I said that right. Okay, benztropine is another one um, that uh, is in this group, right? So this, um, we're going to talk about benztropine again when we talk about Parkinson's. So this is um, mostly used for Parkinson's disease. Okay, here's your glaucoma. Glaucoma, let me just tell you, like, I don't know if you want to make a big... Um, note of this or underline or star or something, but glaucoma is huge contraindication with um, cholinergic antagonists, okay? Huge, huge contraindication, glaucoma. So make sure you make a note of that, okay? So same nursing responsibilities um, with Parkinson. If it's given with Parkinson's disease, you'll want to, you know, monitor those symptoms. Obviously, assess for bowel function, eyes and nose, um, stuff like that. Tolteridine is another one in this group. Um, this one, let's see. I'm just trying to, if there's anything special underlying with this one. Um, a lot of things, contraindications are, can make, let's see, how do I want to put this? A lot of contraindications with drugs are things that it can cause. So if they already have something, 
that they can cause, it's going to make it worse, right? So urinary retention is going to make it worse. Um, glaucoma is going to make it worse. Um, so those types of things are contraindications. Um, let's see. Signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and angioedema, such for rash, urinary urgency, frequency, and incontinence. I can't remember if I took this one off. Like I said, everything's packed. I usually have it right here, so I know. Um, if this, some of these might, those two might not be on your list of meds to know. So you don't necessarily have to focus on them. Just focus on cholinergic antagonists. Okay. Other drugs in this category, dicyclamine, um, glycopyrrolate, scopalamine. We're going to revisit this med again because that's used for motion sickness and nausea and vomiting. So you're going to see this one again. Um, cyclopentolate and impertropium. Um, that one's used very commonly for um, asthma as well like in a, in a duonev type thing. Anyway, wake up question. Which health teaching concept should the nurse review with the patient receiving tolteridine for urge incontinence? Let's go back and look. If we have any hints, maybe. Got a couple different answers. Oh, okay. Here we go, Mark. Sorry, I put it, I switched back. Okay, so exercise, increased fiber and water intake. Okay, so this is. All right, for bradycardia, let's see. Okay, so this medication does not cause any muscle atrophy that we have talked about. Um, increased dietary fiber and water intake. So this patient is taking it for urge incontinence and increasing water intake might cause a problem with that, right? So they don't necessarily want to drink over the water amount because they have urge incontinence and that drinking more water can, can cut, make, make that worse, right? You're going to have to pee more often the more water you drink. And so far, Boots and high iron. It doesn't do anything with red blood cell production. And then monitor heart rate for bradycardia. So I would probably say that is the one <laughs> because we're talking about cholinergics, right? Um, cholinergic antagonists, stuff like that. So that's going to have to do with the heart. And that's the one that makes sense. So I think you guys are all right. Okay, here's another way to, to um, put your charts. So up here, we have your adrenergics, right, and your adrenergic blocker. So this right here is your sympathetic system, right, these two boxes. This down here is your parasympathetic. Now, if you look, these two are very similar. Right, the drugs that um, stimulate the parasympathetic 
are very similar to the ones that block the sympathetic, right? And then here is the same thing. The adrenergic, the fight or flight, get those responses. They're very similar to the anticholinergics, the ones that block the parasympathetic. There's your no glaucoma right there. I want to circle that. Or put like arrows to it. You need to remember that. So you can look at that and think these two are very similar. These two are very similar. I have a lot of students that on their scratch paper with the test, when they start the test, they'll write this down so that they can help um, Olivia, are you talking about back here? Um, well, I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. I'll get back to you guys on that. So, <sighs> I'm I'm the teacher guys and I seriously have sometimes have a hard time. It takes me a hot minute to to keep these straight. So don't give yourself a hard time if you're having uh, if you're having struggles um, remembering this. But so if you are one that kind of dumps, you know, kind of mind dumps on your scratch paper and you you um, write this out, make sure you write it out correctly. <laughs> Because you'll get a lot of questions wrong if you have, you know, if you know that, oh, these two are the same and these two are the same. But then when you write it down, you switch, you know, maybe these two and stuff. So then you're getting a lot of questions wrong because you're thinking cholinergics are like adrenergics when in reality it's anticholinergics or like adrenergics. Does that make sense? So that's where you need to be careful. And um, try to keep them straight. So here's just another um, way to put it all together and kind of keep them organized. Okay, that was a whole lot of information. But do you guys have any questions? <laughs> Any questions? I absolutely am fine with that, Jaden. <laughs> like I said, sometimes I like dive into this stuff and then things I'm saying in my mind or thinking, it, it throws me off too. So, um, I would suggest going through this again, maybe making a couple charts. Um, like I said, let me, I've been trying my cam like this whole time, trying to see if it'll pop up. And for some reason it won't. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. So let me just show you just real quick, kind of how I've done it. Um, let's see. I actually have them typed up on my computer. I just didn't have them printed out, but um, it really helps me. So here's this one side. So here's the adrenergic antagonist and you've got your, your alpha and then your beta and then your alpha is split into your selective and non-selective. And then you have like the meds, the side effects, what they treat, stuff like that. So that I, is very helpful. And a lot of times, um, like when, when students ask me questions, I can, when I could, because I wrote this and I look at it, I can actually visualize where I have that answer on my page. So that's why I think it's very helpful. If, if you guys want to try doing something like this, that you write it out. Um, Okay, so um, 
I'm trying to, to, to show you guys. So, you know, when we talked about adrenergic antagonists, they're split up into the alpha adrenergic antagonist and beta. So I have, I have the alpha. So here's, here's the adrenergic antagonist. And then this side goes over to beta. This side goes over to alpha. And then in your book, it says, oh, but the alpha is, sorry, this is alpha. This is beta. The alpha is now selective and non-selective. So then you have your selective and your non-selective. And then, and then I have like meds that go under here, what their side effects are, what they treat. And then same over here. Then your book will visit the beta side. And then I put all the beta information over here. So does that make sense? Like seriously follow your book. That's exactly what I did. I just followed your book and it just said like, okay, adrenergic antagonists. Now these are split up into two. So then I was like, oh, they split up into two. And then it visits one and it says, okay, so the alpha, they're split up into two. So then I go, oh, they're split up into two. And I just put the, the information from your book under each one. And then it'll go back and visit the beta, just kind of how we did. And then it'll give information on the beta. Um, so if you just um, follow that and anytime it says that it's, you know, has two different classifications or two different um, like selective or non-selective and you're like, okay, then they split. So I can try to, to do a, a la, 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 la. what's the word? An outline, an outline type um, thing, but I'm afraid you're going to be like, but I don't know what information goes there. So this just helped me. You guys can obviously write your notes or study however you feel is easiest for you. Um, okay, so Mark, the, the sympathetic or adrenergic section is chapter 15. And then the cholinergic or parasympathetic is chapter 16 in the book. Okay, if, if, if you guys are, you know, if you're more like this, where you can, you know, these two are the same, these two are the same, not the same, very similar. They have similar um, symptoms, I guess. Not symptoms isn't the right word. Similar, similar actions. There we go. And these have similar actions. And then this is your paras, or this is your sympathetic up here. This is your parasympathetic down here. This um, section is important to understand because in other, um, like for example, when we talk about when we um, allergies and rhinitis and stuff like that, we're going to visit these anticholinergics. And so when I say, oh, Benadryl is an anticholinergic, you need to know, oh, okay, what do anticholinergics do? Does that make sense? So that's a um, an example of how um, these meds are going to be revisited. So if you guys, if any, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to double check that um, question. And get back to you guys on that question. So watch for that. But I will get back to you on that question because I had to try to think through that. So. I didn't have the, the answer right, right away. Yeah, so I'll get back to that and clarify that question for you. Do you guys have any other questions? I know it's all a jumble. I get it. 
But this is one section I suggest that you study. Oh, perfect, Megan, I'll, I'll touch on that. This is one sec, one unit that I suggest you kind of study a little bit each day. Um, because they overlap so much and um, a lot of the verbiage is very similar, I feel like it's going to be really easy for you guys to mix it up if you just try to binge everything, you know, Tuesday night. <laughs> Because it's, it's going to kind of jumble up and you're going to be like, oh, my heck, was that anticholinergic, cholinergic, adrenergic? Like, they all sound very similar. So if you study a little bit each day, you're going to retain a lot more and hopefully be able to keep it straight easier. So that's my suggestion to you. Okay, so the learning activity, let me just pause.